invite you to open the Word of God to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians, the sixth chapter, we'll be reading verse 4. Today we're considering the future of the family. What does the family need to do in order to follow God's prescriptive within His Word that we might safeguard our families, that we might protect our families, we might build a hedge up around our families, that we might honor God's Word as we move to the future? with our families. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4. The last part of that verse states very succinctly as we read from God's Word, bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Bring them up in the training and the admonition of the Lord. May God bless His holy Word. You may be seated. As we have examined God's Word, we have seen some very critical instructions for our lives. Wives, submit yourselves unto your husband as unto the Lord. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Children, obey your parents, for this is right in the Lord. For this call shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cling and cleave unto his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. These are amazing instructions that so often are kind of pushed to the side in our current culture as we are seeking to understand family and what constitutes family. And yet we find that family is a part of God's plan. It's a part of God's purpose for each of us. We are all the product of family. And we are thankful if we have godly families that surround us in love, that pray for us, that encourage us, and that support us. On the other side, we know that oftentimes individuals come out of the context of where their homes were not committed unto the Lord. And they understand what they have missed. And they understand the loss of having a godly father or a godly mother or a godly grandparents who nurtured them and loved them and encouraged them within their life. And they know that there is a part of their life that they have not been able to experience because somewhere along the way, someone chose to ignore what the Word of God teaches is our role and our responsibility as members in, of a family that God has established and ordained. As a matter of fact, in the Old Testament, we find that as, G, as, as God gave the commandments, that He very clearly spoke about the responsibility of family. He talked about he, how God is a, a jealous God and He visits the iniquities of of the fathers, the iniquities of a family unto the third and fourth generation to those who hate him. And the very next verse says, but he also shows mercy unto thousands to those who love him. And so in God's word, we see the direct correlation to establishing the right kind of priority and the right type of legacy within our home and, and within our families, a legacy that will move beyond. Now, we realize that every individual has free will and, and free choice. And oftentimes, individuals have been surrounded by God's love and surrounded by God's mercy and surrounded by godly parents or a godly mom or a godly father. And they have been prayed over, but yet in their own life, they have chosen to rebel and they have chosen to resist and they have chosen to reject the goodness of God that has been graciously bestowed upon their life. And in spite of the best efforts of a mom and the best efforts of a dad, those parents today grieve over the prodigal who has gone to a distant country and has turned away from the truth of God's word. And we stand with you today, you parents, and we pray with you we pray that all that you have placed in the heart and the life of your children will not in any way ultimately be rejected, but they will turn into the Lord and they will find that place of salvation and rest and peace within the Lord. As I stand before you today, I have been looking back over the generations that I am a part of. And as I've been studying the generations, I, I have seen some things that, 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 that I'm so thankful for within the Lord today. As I kind of go back to the future in my, in my own life and in my, my own family, I'm able to see many individuals that God placed within my path that, 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 that I am now a part of today, this legacy and this generational faith and trust in the Lord. As far back as we have gone in studying this it is a man named Roger Green. Roger Green was an Anglican priest. 
Uh, we were, as you'll see, our family, we were mixed up a lot in, in, in terms of church over the years. We finally got it right now, I think. We were all kind of in the Baptist church. But, but prior to that, uh, he, was, he was an Anglican priest. And, and he came over to the States. He was assigned to the, to, at that time to the beginnings of, of the area we now know as Virginia. And, and he was here to make sure of some certain things that, that, were, that were to occur within this formation of community there in Virginia. And he wrote a letter back to the archbishop back in, in, in England. And, and this letter was called Virginia's Cure. As he saw what was going on, the immorality, and as he saw what was going on in terms of the, of the people's lifestyles, he, he knew that there was an absence, a, a total absence of spiritual truth that needed to be found within these homes and families. And I have that document, and I've read it quite a few times. And, and in this document, these are the things that he is asking for the archbishop to appeal to the king and to appeal to the leadership of churches there to do. He says, one, we need evangelism. We need people who will come here for the distinct purpose of telling people about Jesus Christ. He said, the second thing that we need here are churches. We need people to come and plant churches here within these communities that are now being established. He said, the third thing that we need is Christian education. Our children are growing up and they're not learning anything about the Lord the way that they should. And we need, we need schools that can train children in the very truth of God's word that they would have what we would call today a biblical world view. The fourth thing that he asked for was this. He said, sin trained clergy. We need clergy who, who, are, who are trained and who are called that can come in here and that we can put them in these pockets where people are and plant these churches. And then he said... We need to take offerings in the churches there to support all of this. Now, this is in the 1600s. Roger Green is doing that. And in the year 2013, we're still doing the same thing, aren't we? We're calling people to reach out to the lost, to plant churches, to have Christian education, Christian homes, Christian families, and to support that financially with our gifts. And so I look back to the generations that were before me. And through these generations, many of the things that are, that are heavy in my heart are the same things that I'm finding out were in those who have walked before me who had the name Green. The next name that I would identify to kind of point out this is the name Leonard Green. Leonard Green, uh, he gave property and founded the Green's Chapel United Methodist Church. As I said, we, we're all, all over the place in churches. Um, and, and I've had the privilege of preaching in that church, actually. I, I was asked to come. I was in college and preach in that little church. It's far out in the country. I mean, it's just a little beautiful, picturesque setting. There's a, there's a little creek that runs down in front of the church, and, and it's a little red brick church. I mean, it's, if you think of what would look like out in the woods, uh, just this kind of picturesque setting, this, this is this church. And I had the privilege of standing in that church where, where one of my forefathers actually gave the property and did everything that was necessary to found it and start it. And here is this Methodist church that is still existent today. As I look over all of these generations, I mean, these are people who, who were a part of the revolution uh, that, that established our country. They're individuals who served in war wars, or individuals who served in all types of different wars, the Korean War and so forth. And, and, and so I, I'm kind of seeing that, that our family is just a part of Americana, just like your families are a part of this nation. But yet as I look at this, I see that God enable us to have uh, a very clear and strong uh, a spiritual emphasis within this. And the very next listing that we find on the Back to the Future, if you'll move that forward for me, is moving us to this next place where we are right now within our families and within our lives. As I, as I see uh, my grandfather, John Thomas Green Sr., and then John Thomas Green Jr., and then John Thomas Green III, of who I am, and John Thomas Green IV, we were not very creative with names in our family. We just kept adding numbers. And then when our son was having their family, we knew they were going to have a, a son. I went to him and I put my hands on him. I said, I release you from the number burden. Please do not name him John Thomas Green V. Let's stop this madness right now. And they did. And so, so here we see you know, how, how, how the, the, the generations uh, move forward. And, and I'm grateful that I have such a, a heritage and such a legacy. But yet, as I move past my name, I see my three sons and I see, I see two grandsons as well as the grandsons. 
granddaughter with two grandsons. And, and I want to make sure that I am pouring everything and have poured everything that I can of my life into them. Because I want the name of green to have meaning and significance to them. I want, when they say their last name is Green, that they understand that they are part of something that God has been doing for generations and that He still is at work within this family and at work within these homes and work within these lives. And I want them to grow up knowing that if they say that they are part of the Green family, that they want to be carrying forth the banner of the gospel of Jesus Christ, just as I'm able to trace back to 1600, I pray that the Lord tarries by the year, by the year 3000 and something, there's still someone named Green who is speaking the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's what this is all about. That's what we have the privilege of doing, investing in those who come after us. And, 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 and as we see how the Lord moves from generation to generation, if there is a cycle of sin if there's a cycle of brokenness, if there's a, if there's a cycle of ungodliness that has been a part, then you have an opportunity today to take a stand and to stop that within your family. You have the opportunity today to stand like Joshua and to declare, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You have a family waiting for that kind of stand. You have a home that desperately needs that type of stand. And only when we take those types of stands will we see God's blessing showing mercy upon thousands who love him. And so I want us to examine this passage today as we are considering the future of the family. For he first speaks about an investment. Bring them up. Now, that's an important phrase. Bring them up. Parenting and family is not left to happenstance. Parenting and family is not left to just a random collection of ideas and thoughts and events. There is an intentionality that must be found in your home. When the Word of God says, bring them up. It is referring to leadership. It is referring to example. It is referring to you pouring your life into your family. You cannot be absentee and bring them up. You cannot be negligent and bring them up. You cannot be someone who does not take this seriously and bring them up. Bringing them up is a very clear and concise decision that you make, that you will be God's father and God's mother to your children, that you will be God's man and God's woman to your family. And if the future of your family is going to be one that will honor God, then it must begin today. It must begin now. It must begin in your responsibility, in your hour, in your moment that God has granted you. You can't look back to 25 people who have preceded you and say, I hope that what they have done influences here. No, the banner must be held up in every generation by every person who has the privilege of being a leader and a part of a family home. And so when the Bible says, bring them up, there is a clear instruction that is found there. And that instruction is that you must invest in your family. You absolutely must invest your life in your family. I mean, think about it. Everything is said and done. And you've come to the end of your journey. And the legacy that you are leaving will not be measured by your wealth. The legacy that you are leaving will not be measured by all of your accomplishments. The legacy that you are leaving will not be measured by all of the awards that you have on your wall. The legacy that you are leaving will be seen in those who are coming behind you. And what you have done. And how you have poured your life into them. So bring them up. Make that investment. And if you're going to make that investment, it requires time. It requires time. Time. 
No, it's, I'm not saying that you've got to, you know, have your calendar lay out there. Well, today I've got, I'm going to give three hours. And I mean, you know, it's not legalistic kind of time. It's time. It's just being there, being available, being a part of, giving of yourself, sacrificing for, even being willing to put other things aside. There is nothing that says to your children, you love them more than for you to be there for your children, for you to do the things that you ought to do as a mom and a dad for your children, for you to sacrifice for your children. When they see that you love them more than these, when they see that you love them more than that, when they see that you love them more than all this other stuff that just seems to constantly control your time and your life, life and your energy and your best efforts, when they see that you will put that aside for them, then you are making an investment and your children will see that you care genuinely, that you care authentically for them. And they will respond to that type of love. I can't be someone who is never around and someone who is not involved and just show up every now and then with an iron rod. And I'm going to straighten this out and straighten that out because I'm the dad. And that's my responsibility. And that's my authority. Well, you're partially right in that. That is your responsibility. And that is your authority. But you have abused that responsibility. And you have abused that authority if you have not been a part of investing your time in the life of your children. That they see your heart. And they know that you care for them. Invest in them. Bring them up. Yes, your time is critical. And your treasure. When I speak of treasure, your treasure is your children. That's your treasure. I mean, there's nothing we treasure more than our children. I mean, you, you, can, you can talk about a lot of stuff to me, but you talk about my children, that's a whole different conversation. I mean, I treasure my children. I treasure my family. Treasure them. And if you treasure something, your heart is connected to it. That's what the Bible teaches us. You know, where, where, where your heart is, there's where your treasure will be found. And, and if your heart is not linked inextricably to your family, if your heart is not invested totally in your children and your spouse and, and making your home the home that God wants it to be, then your treasure will not be of value and your treasure will not be of worth. Your treasure, those relationships that are around you. That treasure is being able to hold your children's hand and to hug their neck. The, the, the treasure is being able to love them and minister to them when they're hurting. And your, your, your treasure is being able just to all sit together. I mean, you know, that's, that's hard to do today, isn't it? I mean, the, our, 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 our calendars and our lives are just going... Phew, and just to have a privilege of everybody getting together at one time, that's, that's a pretty huge thing in families today. And that's why, that's why our families are struggling and suffering so much. Is that we have allowed everything to rise above family. And maybe the investment today that God's calling you to do is just to examine the priority of your heart. To examine the priority of your decisions, the priority of your life. Maybe, maybe the investment that God is calling you to make today is to say, what is that treasure today? If it were defined in your hand, if it were defined in your heart, what would that treasure be? Would it clearly be your family? Would it clearly be your spouse? Would it clearly be your children that grows out of that relationship with God based on what the Word of God has taught us? Or would your treasure that would be found in your heart and in your hands today, would it just be the junk and the stuff? Of this world. And yet you say. I'm committed to the future. Of my family. When your investment. Does not match. What you are saying. So in order. For your family. To have the future. There must be an investment. In order for the future of your family. To be where God wants it to be. There must be instruction. For the very next phrase says. In the training. In the training, in the training, input and output. When you are speaking truth into your children's lives, when you are leading by example in your children's life, where they are seeing in you decisions that are being made, 
when they see that how you live when you're away from here is consistent with how you are when you're here? When, when, when they see that you can say, oh, how I love Jesus, and, and, and smile as you say that, and yet when you get home, never is the name of Jesus spoken. Never do they see the love of Jesus in you. The, our children see that quickly. And if they see that kind of hypocrisy, if they see that kind of hypocrisy within our lives, then they are not going to understand the importance of faith and trust and obedience unto the Lord. You see what you're consistently placing in them will ultimately be what will seem, be seen coming out of their life. Over the years, I can't even begin to tell you the number of phone calls that I've gotten from fathers or a mom. They said, I think my, my child's now a teenager. They're involved with drinking, alcohol. I know it's probably even progressed further than that. What, what, what can we do? What can we do? And it just doesn't take just a couple of questions to figure out what hasn't been done. Uh, what's in your refrigerator right now? Well, there's, there's a six-pack there. Oh, oh, oh what, what's in that bar at your house? Oh, there's all kind of, you know, liquor there. But that, that's for me. It, well, it's not for them. It's for me. <laughs> you hear what that says? I mean, do, do we see where, where we've missed the mark of, of instruction through all these years? They have seen an example before them. They have seen, you know, the, 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 the beer open. They've seen the, the wine at the meal. They, they, they've seen all of that. They, and, and, and it's okay for mom and dad. And so how can you, as a mom or a dad, say that it's all right for me? And then when they reach a point where they can make their own decisions, you expect them to say, I'm not going to do that? You expect them to say, oh, even though it's all right for mom and dad, I'm not going to make that choice. No, what has been put into their life ultimately what will come out of their life. You have to guard your home. You have to protect your home. And you have to think about every action that is going on in your family and in your life. Because every eye is on you. Every eye. Every eye. They'll see things that you don't even know they're seeing. And when you do it, that's an endorsement. When you say it, that's acceptable in the eyes of your children. Quite a few years ago, we used to do a, a children's church in the in the church that we had in Georgia, and Dr. Dowdy would lead that every Sunday. And uh, he would always have little object lessons that he would bring in. And they were always pretty interesting, you know, the children. And, uh, and so anyway, on the, on, it was getting kind of the springtime, and, you know, picnics and things like that. And so uh, Dr. Dowdy brought in this little igloo cooler, and he had it sitting there. The children came forward and talking about picnics and Going out with the family, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, it's so fun, a great time of the year, Lake Lanier up there and all that kind of stuff. And he said, now, you know, do, do your parents have ice chests, igloos like this, going to picnics? Oh, yes, they do. And he said, what do your parents put in there? Oh! <laughs> we had Baptists speaking in tongues that morning, I want to tell you. <laughs> there was a gas that went over the whole room. It's like, Johnny, today, don't answer the question, whatever you do, you know. Oh, yeah, this is what Daddy puts in our igloo, you know. I mean, so we've got to see. We've got to realize. We've got to understand that if we are modeling something before our children, that's input. And at some point, that will be the output of their life. And in those hours of crisis, we can't cry out, what's wrong? What's happened? Why? I can't believe they would do that. I can't believe those, you have not invested in the future of your family and the moments where you could instruct them in the Lord. Not only do we see the call of instruction, we also see the call of insight. Bring them up. In the training and in the admonition of the Lord. And one of the neatest opportunities is for a mom or a dad to be able to sit down with a son or a daughter and give them truth. 
Sometimes it's corrective truth. Other times it's just wise counsel that surrounds their life. As our kids were growing up in our home, I, I didn't, you know, I, I never really thought about this, you know, as much as I probably do now. I mean, but, but every day that both of these were going on, correction and counsel. Sometimes they were one and the same. Sometimes they were two different things. It wasn't like I had some kind of ledger I was keeping. I've got to do correction today. I've got to do counsel today. It's just life and you're just doing it as you, as you go. But it's so interesting now as our, our boys are older. When they'll call you and they'll say, I need to ask you about something. I want to talk to you about something. Hey, man, that, that is just overwhelming to me. Because I realize that now they're adults and they're living their lives and making their decisions and all that kind of thing. And yet they want to hear from me as they're, as they're doing that. Now, you know, I hope I'm telling them the right stuff. I really do. Uh, and, and, and I'm scared sometimes because they might actually do what I'm telling them to do, you know. And that, that, that's, that's even, that puts even more weight upon this privilege of, of speaking insight. But that's the admonition of the Lord, being that encourager, being that counselor, being that one who provides discipline, being that one who in love understands that responsibility and that role and who realizes that from the time that they're born to the time that they ultimately will leave their home, that is a very narrow window of opportunity. I mean, it seems like, you know, boy, it happens and, and, and you know, boy, you know, the, that you're holding them there just born and it's like, man, what? In, and then you turn around and, and they're walking a stage. And they're graduating from high school and they're graduating from college or they're, they're moving on their careers. And, 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 and you look back and you're like, what happened to all those years? It goes by just that fast. It goes by that quickly. And, and if, we're not, if we're not understanding how important it is right now in this matter of insight and admonition and being, uh, speaking the corrective words and the words of counsel into their life, biblical truth, then, then, then we're going to miss it. And that, that can't start when they get to be 12 or that can't start when they get 15. That can't start when they're 18. It must start immediately, immediately into their life and into their, their home. When our grandchildren were born had the privilege you know of having a few times where since there were two of them you know we, we could kind of split them up you know we had one everybody's arguing over the one to hold with two you can kind of here you take one i'll take one kind of thing and just holding them and just talking to them singing to them reading scripture to them you say they're newborn oh the lord will put it in their heart the Lord will put it in their heart. A few weeks ago, John sent a little video. Lila was in bed. Lights were off, just her little nightlight. And they heard her singing. And so he just kind of stuck his phone in there and was recording it. And she was singing that great praise song, 10,000 Reasons. And, and just singing it, laying there in bed. I mean, Karen and I just cried. Because what we saw is this. What was started generations ago is just being passed on. And, and, and we know that our grandchildren are going to have that same care and that same nurture and that same love. And we are so thankful for that. The future of the family. It's never too late to start. It's never too late to make the right decision. It's never too late to bring your family together and say, in the Lord, in the Lord, in the Lord. And this morning there are children waiting for their dad to take that very stand. Today there are wives waiting for a husband to take that stand. Today, there are parents together who need to take that stand with their children and say, in the Lord, as for me and my house. This is going to be a day that we want to mark as change. We want to say that on March 10, we made a very clear decision within our family 
That we're going to undo some things that have been done. We're going to change some things that have been there. And it's not a legalistic change. It's a, a change that grows out of grace and mercy and love. It's a change that grows out of repentance. It's a change that grows out of humility. It's a change that will say that we want to make a decision in our home that intentionally there's going to be instruction. Intentionally there's going to be insight. Intentionally there are going to be the, the things that we need to do to bring up our children as God. God wants us to do. And it's never too late. We're not going to give up. And maybe today you, you've been in that very life and you've made those right decisions and yet you have children that have, have strayed and have wandered. And you want to come today and just pray for them and pray that maybe even on this day God will speak to their heart in such a way that they will make that very commitment of their life that they need to make in the Lord. And so as we conclude this series on the family, I pray that today that we will be the family God wants us to be and that we'll make the commitments that we must make under the Lord. There are fathers here today who need to give their life to Jesus Christ, the Savior. There are moms here today who need to trust in Jesus Christ, the Savior. That there are children here today who, who need to trust in Jesus Christ as Savior. There are some here today who maybe need to make a phone call today. A phone call to a father or to a mother. A phone call to a son or to a daughter. A, a phone call to a husband or to a wife. And, and you need to make some things right that you have ignored. Issues that you have brought that do not honor God's word. And today, make this the day of change in your heart in your life. We can't expect others if we do not. And so today, under the Lord, would you come and make those commitments of your life? You come to this altar as families and pray. Come to this very place in God's grace and commit your life to Him. Maybe part of that today is just being a part of a church together as a family and God's guiding you here Then we would encourage you to come. Let's stand with every head bowed and every eye closed. Heavenly Father, we pray now for these next moments in the tenderness of your Spirit speaking to our hearts. May we hear, may we respond, may we obey today. Father, we pray for salvation in this room. We pray, Father, for healing within hearts, within homes, within lives. We pray, Lord, that we'll put aside preconceived ideas. We'll put aside, Father, pride. That this will be a day that we'll just humbly come to you and say, Lord... Our past has not always been what it should have been. We've tried. Maybe, maybe we haven't tried. But, Lord, we want our future to be in you. We want our future to be through you. And we commit our family. We commit our marriage. We commit our children. We commit our home. We dedicate our lives to you first and foremost. And in so doing, we know that it will clean up and change and redirect our paths. So, Father, today... We pray that you will take our family and give us a future in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we pray this in his name today, in the name of Jesus. Amen.